Today I'm going to talk about the small RNA revolution that occurred between 1990 and today and how that emerged. My name is Gary Rovkin. I'm a professor of genetics at Harvard Medical School. One learns as an undergraduate the central dogma of molecular biology where DNA makes RNA that makes proteins and small RNAs have modified that over the last 20 years. The first example of the of modification was the microRNAs that I'll go into great detail today. And they are thought to be made uh, from very small transcripts, uh, 22 nucleotides long, that then regulate the translation of target mRNAs uh, to then cause less protein products. So it's another layer of regulation. Uh, but in addition to microRNAs, there's also many other tiny RNAs that are made inside of cells uh, that probably regulate uh, uh, the production of RNA uh, from genes and, and also add a regulatory locus. And those were discovered at about the same time, and I'll talk about that too. So the star of the show is C. elegans, the nematode. And this is the animal that uh, is not as big as my arm. It's a millimeter long. And uh, 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 it has been a subject of thousands of researchers worldwide uh, who work on it. It started as a field uh, by Sidney Brenner. Uh, in the early 60s as the most simple, complicated animal to work on. Uh, the worm is uh, an animal, and it's phylogenetically related uh, to us up here, uh, but pretty distant and much simplified as an animal. Uh, and so simple that instead of having billions of cells, it has 959 cells as a full-grown adult. This is the lineage of the animal. It was worked out by John Sulston in the early 70s. This is showing the pattern of divisions that take place in the embryo. These are the divisions that take place during larval stage one. Uh, you can see here, larval stage two, larval stage three, larval stage four, and out pops an adult. And it produces uh, progeny every three days. So it's a very uh, fast genetic system that attracted a lot of talent. Uh, and the field of C. elegans has always been very influential to me in particular. Uh, it's just f populated with uh, really wonderful people who work on many different biological problems. Uh, and I've always felt blessed to have been surrounded by uh, people who work uh, on so many different aspects of the biology of this animal. It's a way to learn everything about biology in a microcosm on one organism. Uh, it, the particular project uh, that I'll be describing in detail was started uh, in, uh, at the MRC, which was the center, the Medical Research Council, the center of where worms started at Sidney Brenner's lab. Actually, Marty Chalfie started this project uh, discovering the LIN4 uh, mutation uh, back in the uh, mid-70s. Uh, and this is a mutation that causes lineage changes. And those lineage changes look like changes in time. So if you look at the wild type lineage over here, this complicated pattern of divisions that takes place in the larval stage one is only takes place in larval stage one in wild type, but yet in a LIN4 it goes at the L1, L2, L3, and L4 stage, uh, keeps reiterating. So this animal is retarded. It never really gets to the adult stage. It always uh, has patterns of division as if it's a larval, larval animal. Uh, and what really uh, sort of launched this project to uh, be really uh, important to do uh, was when Victor Ambrose uh, began to work on it uh, when he was a postdoc in Bob Horvitz's lab uh, in the early 80s and discovered the gene LIN14 could suppress mutations in LIN4. So it could take this complicated set of divisions that are temporally uh, uh, aberrant and instead of doing L1, 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 it would go straight to L2 uh, and therefore have a pattern of, of divisions that's distinct in time. And this allowed him to infer that uh, LIN4 was a negative regulator of the gene LIN14 uh, to set up this, uh, how developmental timing works. And so uh, Victor and I worked together as postdocs on this project to try and figure out how LIN4 and LIN14 regulate form a regulatory uh, axis to, to set, set up the timing of the animal. So we uh, together identified uh, the genetic locus, the, 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 the actual molecular basis of LIN14. And what we the first thing we figured out was that 
uh, mutations that activate the LIN14 gene are deletions not of the open reading frame of the gene here, it's downstream of the open reading frame, but actually mutations in the 3' untranslated region or a, a translocation of the 3' untranslated region that takes these conserved regions shown in gray and either deletes them or, or uh, translocates them away. Uh, and so that said that there's an off switch on the LIN14 gene, and this is part of the off switch. And the way it gets turned off uh, is by this negative regulator LIN4 shown here. Uh, and so what was LIN4? And the key breakthrough here came out of Victor's lab uh, when he was a, uh, an assistant professor at, at Harvard. And, and what his lab figured out, uh, Rosalind Lee and Rhonda Feinbaum and Victor, uh, was that LIN4 didn't code for a protein at all. Uh, it codes for a very small RNA uh, that's 22 nucleotides long. That's shown in the gray box here. And the precursor of LIN4 um, is shown as this double-stranded RNA. Uh, and this RNA is upregulated right at the time of L1, which fits with the phenotype that uh, what we were studying. So after the Ambrose lab figured out that LIN4 encodes a tiny RNA, we, Victor and I compared the sequence of his LIN4, shown on the bottom strand here, to the sequence of LIN14, assuming that it might be a direct interaction, which you never know if it's direct or indirect in biology, but let's assume simplicity. And so we could immediately see that there were seven different sites on the LIN14 UTR, and so they're numbered one through seven here. And for example, here's number one, and that's shown over here. There's the top strand is LIN14, the bottom strand is LIN4. And in every case, uh, there was duplex, but you can notice that it's not a perfect duplex, so the LIN4 will bulge a C here, it will bulge an ACCUCA over here. And each one had a, a sort of a non-perfect duplex. On the other hand, uh, we could see by evolutionary comparisons, uh, comparing the sequence of LIN14 on the top strand to between Cinerabditis elegans and Briggsy, uh, that all the bolded letters are conserved between C. elegans and C. Briggsy. So that said that the sequence of this is, is important enough for the animal to have conserved it over many millions of years. Uh, and so we proved uh, that this, uh, these elements were important uh, by moving this 3' UTR onto reporter genes and knocking out these sites uh, to prove it was important. Uh, and um, this was the first example uh, of an R a regulatory RNA that was that small, in the case of LIN4. Uh, and it was much smaller than any other regulatory RNA. For example, the uRNAs are more like 100 nucleotides than 20 nucleotides. Uh, in this, uh, in the developmental biology community, it was the community we were a part of that in included, for example, uh, many C. elegans geneticists, many Drosophila geneticists, uh, they paid attention to this. We definitely talked about this at Gordon conferences and things like that. Uh, but there was always a view that this is a kind of a quirky thing, that uh, maybe a quirk of the lineage of C. elegans, because remember, uh, we're dealing with, with a, a lineage here, which was a, a distinct way to think about developmental biology and, and uh, really uh, a, a sort of marginal in comparison to how the the wider developmental biology community thought more about tissue interactions and cell interactions. And so, um, yes, we presented it at meetings and things like that, but it wasn't really, there wasn't a, a stampede for people to start to work on that, that's for sure. Uh, on the other hand, the regulatory RNA community, the people who work on the ribosome, how tRNAs bind to the acceptor sites, that sort of thing, uh, splicing, they were totally enthralled with this. and so. Uh, it was exciting to us to sort of be thrust into the regulatory RNA community. Remember, we're, we're coming as developmental biologists. What, what we happen to find, a regulatory RNA and its target, thrusts us into a new ecosystem. And that ecosystem uh, informed us in many ways. Uh, is very sophisticated, uh, how the ribosomal RNA folds, uh, how the ribosome works. Uh, these are, these are um, inspirational fields. Uh, and it's one of the great things about biology is that there's these islands of specialization uh, and you can learn a lot from each island. And, uh, biology teaches us that, that, that uh, islands are, are, are where the, the most extreme 
uh, variation occurs. So how does the LIN4 microRNA work? Well, it, LIN4 gets upregulated at the L1 stage, and that causes less production of the LIN14 protein. That's its target. Uh, but it doesn't really affect the mRNA levels nearly as much as it affects the protein levels. So that said, that the way microRNAs work, this one microRNA, uh, is by regulating the translation of target proteins. We still don't know, even 20 years later, exactly how that's working. It's still an object of uh, much research uh, in, in uh, microRNAs. The next stage... Uh, Right now, we're at 1993, approximately. The next stage is seven years later, uh, when we start doing genetics to try and fill out the rest of the pathway to figure out who else is being regulated to specify these lineages. And we get LET7 as a suppressor of a weak LIN14 mutation. And when we figure out what LET7 is, we figure out that it's another uh, microRNA. In this case, uh, it looks a lot like the first one. It's not homologous at all, but it's analogous. It has the same stem loop structure. The gray box is the 22 nucleotide product of that. And in this case, uh, the, the LET7 microRNA, when we compared its sequence across emerging databases, now remember, this is the year 2000 as opposed to 1992, so genome databases are much more sophisticated. The human genome in the year 2000 is about 30% done. So we could compare it to the 30% done genome sequence, not by doing northern blots or anything like that, but by just doing a BLAST-N analysis, just asking, is the nucleotides conserved? And boom, we could see it 20 seconds later. And that was an amazing moment uh, because the activation energy to actually do a northern blot or some kind of experiment to look for conservation is, takes some oomph to do that. But looking in a genome, you could do it in 20 seconds and know the answer. Uh, and so we sort of instantly knew that LET7 was conserved in flies and in, in humans in genome sequences. But we also had to, of course, prove that it was a small RNA. So we did do a lot of northern blots to a whole zoo of creatures. Uh, and that was very influenced uh, by a, a, a comparative developmental biology uh, conferences that uh, Eric Davidson had run at, at Marine Biological Labs, where I'm actually giving this, speaking to this camera right now. Uh, now, at about the same time that we were finding this second microRNA in the year 2000, uh, Fire and Mellow and Balcom and Hamilton had found that tiny RNAs uh, are produced by in RNA interference, which was a, a very hot topic at that point. It was very mysterious how injecting double-stranded RNAs into organisms would inactivate genes. And uh, Hamilton and Balcom found 22 nucleotide RNAs. Uh, I was enthralled by the fact that uh, the microRNAs and the, the uh, uh, sRNAs are the same size. And I remember the number 22 uh, was a, an important number in the Kabbalistic uh, numerology. And sort of as a yuck, I found websites to show my lab. And they, they worried about me doing this. Uh, much more productive was to say, okay, if, if they produce the same size RNAs, maybe they use some of the same enzymology. And the enzymes that take uh, double-stranded RNAs and chop them into sRNAs were being discovered, for example, by Greg Hannon's lab at Cold Spring Harbor. And so we could do the experiment of inactivating uh, the gene for that uh, double-stranded RNA dicer, RNAs dicer, and show that that was actually important in how microRNAs uh, get processed as well. The other importance of the, of the synchrony of the discoveries of, of the RNAi pathway and the micro pathway uh, is that there was a huge interest in RNAi as a tool. Uh, uh, the C. elegans community was probably the, one of the very first genetic communities to start using RNAi in a big way. Uh, but it also started to happen a lot in plants. And once siRNAs were discovered in animals, uh, they started to be used all over animal labs. So the, the interest in, in it as a tool was, was immense. Uh, and it made the uh, interest in microRNAs and small RNAs in general much larger than it would have been if it was just microRNAs. So after LET7 was discovered as a, as a conserved microRNAs, there was a concerted effort to uh, purify by cloning many different microRNAs. And 
Actually, Victor Ambrose's lab uh, was one of the first to do that, along with uh, the Bartel lab and the Tushel lab. And many microRNAs were discovered. And within a year or two, there were thousands of known microRNAs. And the current census uh, must be tens of thousands of microRNAs. Uh, and it is known now that microRNAs regulate many, many different targets uh, and are regulating those targets to regulate all kinds of processes. They work everywhere from floral development in plants to perhaps how memories are formed. Uh, there's thousands and thousands of papers on microRNAs in all different fields from uh, plants and animals. More generally, the small RNA field uh, it's thought that there's many sources of double-stranded RNAs. Uh, one of those sources is microRNAs, as I started with, but there's also viral double-stranded RNAs, repeats in the genome. Uh, they go through this process of making tiny RNAs using DICER and various other components, and they then regulate gene expression. Uh, they regulate gene expression by a variety of mechanisms. The ones I've told you about so far are uh, translational repression and RNA degradation, which siRNAs mediate by simply causing cleavage. Uh, more mysterious is the regulation of heterochromatin that also involves small RNAs, uh, and how that histone modification responds to small RNAs is a big mystery today. Thank you very much. <laughs>